Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alera Arimaloye, and I am going to be, um, I suppose, presenting the webinar to you today. I'm one of the uh, legal advisors at Lisa and a solicitor. We have muted everyone's phone, but feel free to send in questions. You can type in your questions in the chat box, which would be on the right-hand side of your screen. And I, my proposal is to take any questions at the end of the webinar, which is scheduled to last um, an hour. So I'm just uh, trying to get to the slides now. A bit of a technical hiccup. There we go. So you will have um, copies of the slides in front of you, but I, you know, the proposal is to sort of go through them as we have a discussion really around them. A lot of the um, material, as I say, uh, you will have in front of you. Now, I'll be looking today at a number of cases on service charges, the right to manage, uh, collective enfranchisement under the 1993 Act, uh, lease extensions, and uh, buy the freehold interest in a house under the Leasehold Reform Act 1967. So, uh, just a list though, of the cases that we will be covering over this hour and the relevant legislation, which I will leave you to read. Now, the first case here is on service charges, and it's a ca case of Kane and Islington in London Borough Council, uh, Upper Tribunal decision dated 25th of September 2015. I think it is fair to say that uh, Mr. Kane and Islington in Borough Council, you know, have quite a, a long and fractious relationship over service charge disputes. I mean, there's another case which we're not going to be looking at today, which covered, again, issues about apportionment of service charges and the proper methodology. But for today's purpose, we're going to be looking at what does it really mean, I suppose, in a practical sense when the leaseholder challenges service charges, particularly if they haven't made it clear over a period of time that they are in dispute about it. I think what tends to happen is that leaseholders, if they are in dispute about service charges, uh, would make that clear, either sort of say, although I'm making the payment, it is made under protest so that the landlord is aware that there is an issue. But if the leaseholders happily pay service charges over a period of time, uh, can they then go back in time, if you like, to say, well, although I made those payments and although I didn't quite um, – State to you that I was unhappy about the um, reasonableness of the charges or whatever else I had concerns about, I'm not going back in time, if you like, to challenge those service charges. And so that was the central issue here, is that what, what would constitute, if you like, an admission or agreement as to the reasonableness of the service charge? Uh, would it be enough just to pay it without more, or would, it, would there have to be some kind of intention, if you like, some kind of explicit intention um, on the part of the, 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 the payer to say, although I'm paying it, I'm really not happy about the reasonableness, and I will sort of reserve my position on that in future. So that's what this case um, really uh, is about, the, the meaning and effect of, um, you know, sort of, uh, I suppose, an admission or agreement of service charges for the purpose of making an application to the tribunal under Section 27A, subsection, um, well, 27A, um, as to the reasonableness otherwise of the service charge. Now, again, just a, a bit of a um, reminder, if you like, of what the statutory provisions say. You know, 27A, subsection 4, subsection A says that, you know, you really can't make an application to tribunal if you have agreed or admitted that the service charge was payable. I suppose that goes without saying, you know, you're not going to go back having paid it quite happily or admitted that it was payable to then seek to challenge at a tribunal. So that's a general premise, if you like, of Section 27A, um, subsection 4, subsection A. But then the fact of making payment is not enough to oust, if you like, the tribunal's jurisdiction, and that's what 27A, subsection 5, tells us, you know, that just by making payment, it's not enough to, it's like, form the premise of you having admitted that the amount was 
you know, payable or, or, or reasonable. So again, I suppose what would constitute that, uh, which you have to do, which makes it clear that you are in dispute about uh, the payment, although you have made it, but, uh, you know, if there is a dispute about it, then what, what would be the ingredients of you making it clear to the landlord that uh, there was a dispute in spite of the making of payment, because as we know, section, uh, subsection 5 of 27A is saying that uh, just by making the payment is not enough to admit um, that the payment was due and therefore payable. And so, again, just a bit of, I suppose, uh, image there for your, um, you know, light in the mood, if you like. So, again, we're just going to look a little bit about the facts here. So, he bought the flat in 2002, Mr. Kane. His application to the tribunal was actually made in July 2014, and it, but the period of dispute dated back from 2002 to 2013. And I think just uh, as a bit of, uh, a bit of background, he sort of raised questions over the period of time. So it's not like he sat there quietly and paid the demands as they came, but he'd raised questions about, you know, sort of what services were provided, you know, what are we paying for, I suppose, the frequency of cleaning and things like that. But the types of questions that he'd raised over that period of time didn't go to the heart of a dispute about the reasonableness of service charges. There were more, as the upper tribunal described it, in the way of information gathering rather than a dispute about the reasonableness of service charges. So again, you've got the flavor of the types of questions that he asked over the period of time prior to making this tribunal application. And what, when he went to the tribunal, the first year tribunal property chamber, the tribunal took the view that, look, a lot of these charges are quite historic. You did pay them. You didn't really make it clear when you were paying that you disputed them. And it's been really a long time for you to come to the tribunal with the claims dating back to 2002. And so what we're going to try to do is to limit your claim to the last six years rather than a historic claim from 2002 onwards because of the time delay. In a way, I think the tribunal did sort of make a lot of issue about the time delay. They sort of seem to rely on this sort of, I suppose, equitable doctrine of latest. You know, if you, if you delay some, you know, exercising your right, then in a way you could be ousted from relying on, on your conduct of delay. And so they sought to limit the time, if you like, to um, the last six years rather than 12 or, or nearly 13 that he claimed. And the other tribunal sort of didn't quite agree with the LV, uh, FTC's reasoning on that. They said that, you know, um, again, an agreement or admission may be, you know, quite sort of clear cut, nothing is done, you're paying it, or from the circumstances and the facts of the case, it's objectively assessed that yes, you have admitted or agreed that these amounts were payable. The fact that you've made, you know, one payment um, on its own may not be enough to prove that you've agreed or admitted that the payment is due. But if you have made multiple payments, i.e. those payments that have been made over a period of time, in this case over about 12 years, then that could be indicative of the fact that you were quite happy to make these payments. And so if you haven't made it clear, and, and a lot of the times when we advise leaseholders here, we do sort of say, well, if you're you know, sort of in dispute about it, do make it clear when you make the payments, because you know, people make payments for all sorts of reasons, you know, to avoid breach of covenant, forfeiture proceedings, and all that sort of thing. So if you're one of those who says, you know, I'm going to pay, but I'm not quite happy, or I don't consider that the charges are reasonable, then the way that you preserve your position would be to make the payment under protest. So if multiple payments have been made over a period of time, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve years, whatever, and it's clear from all the times of making those payments that uh, the leaseholder wasn't happy to, to make the payments, then it, you know, it's probably, I think, prudent to, to sort of have some, uh, you know, sort of some evidence that backs that position up, i.e. A, a letter or an email to the landlord to say, look, although I'm making the payment, it's made under protest. That is clear because that's explicit um, in terms of your dissatisfaction with the, um, with the service charge. Um, again, each case will depend on its own facts. You know, it's always a question of fact and degree, as you know, with these matters that go to tribunal. But, you know, sort of, I think it, it's fair to say that this came, you know, this case of, uh, of Kane makes it clear that you've got to have something explicitly saying that you're in dispute about the service charges. And I think it's fair to say that, again, a long delay would not be very helpful. So if, if there is a sort of long time between, even if you have made a 
clear that you're making these payments under protest, but you've, you've taken a long time to get to tribunal. As you know, evidence does get tainted, witnesses may have left the organization and all sorts of things. So it's always best, if you like, when uh, these issues come up to sort of, you know, time, I would suggest, would be of the essence in terms of making an application to tribunal so that a leaseholder or whoever is challenging the service charges um, wouldn't be affected by, you know, sort of uh, tainting of evidence and all sorts of things. But tribunal, upper tribunal did sort of agree that, you know, with the tribunal that, you know, charges from 2001, 2002 to 2007 could not be admitted in terms of a dispute because the leaseholder hadn't done anything to suggest that he hadn't agreed or admitted that those amounts were payable. Um, subsequent years would become um, matters of dispute. And the tribunal is quite critical when you read that decision about the leaseholder's conduct in actually preparing that case. You know, information was all over the place. It wasn't even clear what the issues were in terms of the, the actual service charge amounts that were disputed. Again, as I said, he had raised questions over the period of years, but the upper tribunal describes those questions as more um, information gathering rather than any sort of challenge of the reasonableness or otherwise of service charges. So that's a good case uh, I suppose to be aware of in terms of what needs to be done to identify a dispute about service charges and to make it clear that um, you know, just making the payment is not enough to agree or admit liability. Um, you know, you've got to sort of make, as I said before, I think raise the point about I'm making payment under protest. You know, it's clearly not an admission of my liability, just paying it. I may be paying it because there are other concerns about breach of covenant or forfeiture proceedings. Uh, but although payment is made, it's made under protest. It's got to be that type of explicit um, information to the landlord to, to make certain that um, the service charges were disputed and also this sort of element of delay, you know, not keeping it away for too long before an application to tribunal is made under Section 27A. Now we move on to the next case. This is again another sort of interesting one, the Waller and London Borough Council. Um, and I raised this case uh, as one that I, I hope you'd be interested in because of the issues that it brings up, not just about, well, I suppose service charges in a broad sense, but when the costs are incurred relate to improvement work. So not just your ongoing, uh, you know, sort of uh, maintenance or repair issues, when those works actually encompass what could be described as improvement, then the consideration that the landlord ought to have in those circumstances. Now, uh, Ms. Waller owned a you know, sort of long leasehold flat with, with uh, London Borough of Hounslow. And again, as a lot of you may be aware of the sort of decent home standard, um, London Borough Council was carrying out a major work program, which I think her share of the cost was going to be something like £55,000, a lot of money, uh, to the roof. They were changing the roofs um, over various, various blocks from a flat roof to a pitched roof. They're also going to be replacing the windows. They've had historically problems with the windows in, in terms of the setting of the windows. I think the hinges uh, were not sort of strong enough to carry the weight of the windows. So, you know, again, as with all these sorts of um, works, they, they sort of relied on, on expert evidence from their architects, uh, internal surveyors, and all those types of people as to what approach the works would take. Um, where Ms. Waller lived was a mixture of, you know, as you can imagine, social tenants and leaseholders, and she was one of, I think, about 140 leaseholders. Most of the um, uh, tenants in the, in, the, in the blocks of flats were a short shot whole tenant. So London Borough Council was actually carrying, if you like, a, a lot of the weight of the cost because, uh, you know, these homes had to be brought up to, 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 you know, the decent home standards for a lot of, I suppose, the social tenants and leaseholders. So, Again, I suppose if you, if you were hit with a bill for £55,000, you probably would be, um, you know, sort of quite concerned. And Ms. Waller sort of felt concerned not only at the cost of the work, but also the approach the council had taken in terms of the decision making. She wasn't quite confident in the way that they, they made the decision to um, change uh, the roof from, from flat to pitched. And also, more importantly, I think, with the window, because with the window project, you also had cladding work that needed to be done. And because the buildings were quite old, there was 
a risk of asbestos and obviously having to treat the asbestos before putting on new cladding and then obviously uh, replacing the window. So it's quite a lot of money and, and she was concerned. She thought, well, particularly with the windows that um, perhaps a, a more reasonable decision would have been to find ways of repairing uh, the hinges or finding suitable alternatives rather than wholesale replacement because a wholesale replacement involves these additional costs of cladding and asbestos uh, removal and treatment. So she obviously um, raised her concerns about this, and so when this went to the, you know, started off at the, you know, the lower tribunal, they sort of, you know, Ms. Ms. Waller again engaged her expert to advise on whether or not the, the, the uh, decision making by the council was uh, was reasonable, and her expert and the, and the council's expert agreed that okay, perhaps in terms of uh, long term benefit, economic benefit. Changing the roofs from flat to pitch wasn't such a bad idea. It was reasonable. So that wasn't really a matter to be, to be sort of uh, disputed. But what was more important, I think, was the Windows replacement project because of the additional cost that this was going to engage. And um, her expert obviously had a different um, idea from the, the uh, council's expert on, on the Windows replacement project. But this, the decision to replace the windows had actually been taken about six or seven years before the works were actually done. So you can imagine, because of that time delay, a lot of water would have passed under the bridge, uh, things would have been forgotten, council employees would have left. So it did make it a bit difficult, to, I suppose, for the tribunal to ascertain properly whether or not the decision to, to, to replace the windows rather than look for repair alternative was a reasonable one. But, you know, the tribunal had to make it with the evidence that it had. And so, in a sort of, oh, I suppose, not, to, not in a very clear way, the tribunal did agree that although the decision to replace the windows could have been done, perhaps, taken in a different or in a more sort of reasoned way, the costs were reasonably incurred. And, and as far as the tribunal were concerned, costs were reasonably incurred overall and, you know, the, the adjusting the figures a little bit here and there, they would um, accept, you know, the overall amount as reasonable. Now, Ms. Wander wasn't quite happy with this because, in her opinion, the windows didn't need to be replaced. Uh, they could be repaired uh, without replacement, and if they were repaired without replacement, then the additional cost of, of cladding and asbestos treatment and removal wouldn't be an issue. And so it went up to the upper tribunal. And I suppose what's quite significant about this case is the upper tribunal's decision in terms of how you treat improvements. And so what then, this case was heard at the upper tribunal by Siobhan McGrath, sitting as a, a tribunal, uh, upper tribunal judge, you know, when the rules changed, uh, the tribunal procedure rules changed in 2013. Tribunal judges considers upper tribunal um, uh, judges as well. So from the lower tribunal, the president sat as the upper tribunal as a judge. And so her take on this was that, you know, again, it's up to the landlord, you know, so it's the landlord that has discretion as to undertaking work, although there is the process of consultation and all that. Ultimately, the choice is the landlord. But when the works involve improvement, this is where it gets um, quite important. It's that you, the landlord has got to take into account not just their decision making or their discretion, they also have to take into account the leaseholder's interests, the leaseholder's views, the financial impact on the leaseholders, and alternatives. So again, improvement in a way in, as far as the upper tribunal is concerned, has to be given a, not, not a special treatment as such, but a, a new way of looking at works that constitute improvements. Sometimes it's not very clear what is a repair, what is an improvement. But if it is apparent from the fact that what you're doing constitutes an improvement, i.e., you know, installing something new that wasn't there before, then you've got to take into account all these other issues that have an impact on the service charge pair. And now here it's a local authority, so Again, the, the, the leaseholder's uh, interest more important. But if it was a private block, you know, not non-local authority, the same principles would apply in terms of how you, how the landlord, when they're sort of making the decision to carry out improvement works, what they should bear in mind. So it's not enough to exercise the discretion. It's also quite importantly to take into account other interests including leaseholder interest, and also to sort of source for alternatives. What would be the best way of, of looking at this? And, and the upper tribunal is quite critical 
not only of the council's expert um, evidence, you know, the sort of surveyor, but the fact that they made the decision quite a long time ago before the works were actually carried out. And so a lot of the sort of reason behind why they decided to replace rather than source for other materials couldn't really be, be, be fathomed. Uh, and so they're quite critical, you know, the local authorities um, uh, decision in that sense. But they sort of said, look, we have a new test for improvement and you've got to bear all these things in mind. Now, one other thing to, to sort of uh, mention here is that what the Upper Tribunal then decided to do was to sort of remit the matter back to the uh, First Year Tribunal for, you know, the sort of um, how much would be a reasonable cost for her to pay. They did acknowledge that she had got the benefit of new windows, but because these other matters, you know, if I go back to the slide, hadn't really been taken into account. There wasn't, if you like, a proper record of, you know, the, the, the leaseholders' views on, on the proposals and the availability of alternative um, and less expensive remedies. They thought that those costs hadn't been reasonably incurred for the replacement windows. And so the matter was sent back to the tribunal for that type of assessment. Now, London Borough Councillor obviously wasn't happy with this decision, and so the matter has been listed for hearing at the Court of Appeal by the 24th and 25th of January 2017. Hopefully, we will have, you know, sort of feedback on that closer to the time. It is a bit bizarre that, you know, when, you know, it was initially listed for 2016, but it's been moved a year, so there's listing problems and all that. So hopefully, the, the evidence that we're going to be hearing for that will still be fresh, and, um, and we will get a decision on that. But I I think suffice it to say that, you know, prudent landlords or their advisors should be looking at, you know, if we're going to be carrying out works of improvement, then do bear in mind what are the leaseholders' views, um, less expensive uh, alternatives, and, you know, sort of matters that could sort of, um, you know, make it more difficult to recover the full extent of the cost if these issues haven't been properly considered um, when you're looking at improvements. Bear in mind that this test is really sort of limited to works of improvement rather than your uh, repairs or maintenance. Now, we're just going to be looking now, we've sort of finished the, uh, the service charges cases. We're going to be looking at a right to manage. I think, I was just thinking the other day, right to manage just seems quite hotly contested. I, I think anyone who's advising on, 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 on right to manage, particularly if you're acting for the right to manage company, um, must just, you know, make sure that all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted, because if the landlord is going to resist the claim, they will sort of, you know, take up any and everything. Uh, this one that we're looking at, not quite sort of challenging the right to manage, uh, this is to do with cost. You know, what is the approach uh, that a tribunal takes when costs are an issue? If the right to manage company, um, you know, seeks to withdraw its application before the tribunal, which in this case, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the right to manage company, as you know, is liable for landlord's reasonable costs. These are set out in sections 87 and 89 of the Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act 2002. And it is liable for those reasonable costs if it decides that it no longer wishes to acquire RTM, either where it withdraws the claim notice or the counter notice is served and the RTM decides not to apply to tribunal or just withdraws the application to tribunal, as I said. So, again, these uh, such provisions set out um, the basics in terms of liability for costs. Now, what had happened here was that the RTM served the claim notice and um, a few months later um, decided on receiving, well, the counter notice was served where the landlord challenged uh, the claim. The RTM then decided to, you know, apply to the tribunal um, to determine the dispute about whether or not they had the right. But while that was going on, so they'd launched an application at the tribunal, they then got their expert um, report, which showed that the building didn't quite qualify in terms of um, the qualification criteria. And so naturally they decided, okay, when our building won't qualify, although we've launched an application before the tribunal, we better withdraw that application before things get too far and we're incurring all these costs. So essentially, that's the gist of that. Now, the way that they um, went through the uh, tribunal application was to write to the tribunal to say, look, tribunal, uh, we're no longer proceeding with this, and this is our letter to, to withdraw this, and invited the tribunal to contact 
the other part, which the tribunal duly did. And so the question was whether or not the, their cost liability was limited to the letter to the tribunal saying, we're now formally withdrawing this case, and so no further cost should be um, incurred. Certainly not the landlord's cost that we'd be responsible for. And that was essentially the dispute. Now, you see here this case of O12 Beijing. This was a case um, that uh, this company had actually taken the tribunal. They sort of taken it up against the tribunal for judicial review. And in that case, um, a claim notice had been given, negative counter notice was served, RTM company duly made a tribunal application, a hearing was fixed, hearing date was fixed. And there were costs incurred, obviously, preparing for that hearing and all that. Then prior to the hearing, they did in a way a bit similar to this, RTM decided we no longer wish to pursue the claim and then sought to withdraw the tribunal application that they'd made for a determination about whether or not they were entitled. And so what the High Court had decided was that uh, the communication to the tribunal was not enough to complete the proceedings. Because if it was enough, then RTM's um, cost liability would be limited. And so that was what the um, High Court de de uh, determined, that the communication to the tribunal was not enough. And they, the High Court then emphasized this point about the effect of a withdrawal. How, does the, how is the withdrawal for the purposes of the statutory provisions, you know, sections 87 and 89 that we were looking at? For the purpose of those statutory provisions, the withdrawal can only take place when the tribunal consents. And the tribunal consents to it by actually dismissing the, the claim on the basis of a withdrawal. So until the tribunal dismisses the claim on the basis of a withdrawal, the cost will be payable. So it's not enough to write to the tribunal to say, tribunal, we no longer wish to continue. No, it doesn't end there. That's not enough for the purposes of sections 87 and 89. The tribunal would have to formally, if you like, dismiss the claim by, and it might be the reason given by way of withdrawal, but something would have to be an action, would have to be taken by the tribunal to dismiss the claim before it can be said that the claim is actually, um, you know, sort of at an end. And then obviously cost liability would then flow from that. And so this case of O12 Baytree was referred to in the judgment. Now we're just going to look a little bit here at, at, at Section 88, Subsection 3, which again, talks about this sort of, I so that's the basis uh, for uh, the, tribunal dismiss, the tribunal dismissal. So as you see on the slide, it says that an RTM company is liable for any cost which such a person incurs as part of any proceedings under this chapter before tribunal, only if the tribunal dismisses an application by the company. And so here, just, you know, sort of relaying that to the facts, just writing to the tribunal to say we're withdrawing our application is not enough for the cost liability. Until the tribunal finally dispenses of that by dismissing it, then cost liability will still be incurred by the, um, the landlord. And so, again, just what I said is what the upper tribunal decided. That letter withdrawing application is not enough. The only way that it can be, um, I suppose, that what the matter then is when the tribunal dismisses the application. And so, RTM company was liable for the landlord's cost, although having said that, the cost issue, I mean, was something like nearly £30,000 was going to be determined by the tribunal as to reasonableness. Now we're going to be looking at another right to manage decision, and this one, again, I think to do with the precision of information in terms of the claim notice, the articles of association, and all that sort of thing, because that's precisely what happened here. Um, I suppose people who advise on right to manage have got to be extremely careful about drafting the claim notice, making sure the articles um, sort of confirm with, you know, the right to manage company's intention and purpose, because so many cases of the tribunal where things haven't been properly drafted or information has been missing and the landlord seizes on that, particularly if the landlord is resistant to right to manage. So what has happened, again, just some statutory uh, provisions here. What is the right to manage company? That's defined by Section 73, Subsection 2. Again, it's a company in relation to premises if it's a private company limited by guarantee and the memorandum of association states what the objects are, which is to acquire and exercise the right to manage the premises. The brief facts here, block of 13, all were happy to um, go for the right to manage, so they served a claim notice on the 8th of January. Landlord then served a negative counter notice, and that necessitated an application to the tribunal for determination. 
In the model articles itself, it's the object was that to manage flat 1 to 13, 51 Earls Court Square. So this is what the model article said, and the landlord said, well, um, really, that's not enough. Um, just saying that you're going to, well, this is what the landlord's position, remember, just saying that you're going to be managing flats 1 to 13, 51 Earls Court Square, um, and not premises to which the RTM applied, because you've only, in a way, I think quite pedantic, my personal opinion, but anyway, I, you know, it's not about my personal opinion. Anyway, but, but the landlord argues that you didn't include the, you know, the common parts of uh, the building, you just said, you know, where well, you're going to essentially be managing the, those flats without managing the common parts and all those areas that, you know, a right to manage company would, in accordance with the statutory provisions, have the rights of management over. The tribunal, again, I suppose, found in favour of the right, right to manage company and said, look, that information, flats 1 to 13, 51 Earls Court Square, was enough to identify the premises that the right to manage company would be responsible for. And so we're going to admit that, you know, they, the right to manage company can exercise the right in due course. As you can imagine, the landlord was unhappy with that decision and appealed. And the other tribunal actually upheld the, uh, um, the lower tribunal's decision. And it said that the model articles, what the, what's the objective of the model articles? They state, or one of them would be to state what the object of the RTM is and identify within those objects the premises. So uh, what would a reasonable reader uh, infer from that? If they saw flats 1 to 13, 51 Earls Court Square, they would imagine that it was, you know, the building in its entirety. The RTM is set up to manage, you know, the building uh, common parts and all that. So, uh, you know, a reasonable reader would infer from that information describing the premises that it was going to be the premises in its totality, including the common parts. And so this sort of, i just go back and finish the point. So this sort of, you know, pedantically looking at the, the description of the building in the, in the model articles and the description of the building in the claim notice, you know, again, the sort of approach by the landlord trying to resist it on the basis that you haven't quite made clear the entirety of your, of the premises. It's not enough to take the premises out of uh, the right to manage. In a way, I suppose, if the landlord, um, I would say that the landlord's clutching at straw you know, looking for every opportunity to frustrate the RTM company's desired objective. But that's not to say that um, in drafting the model articles and the claim notices, although these forms are prescribed uh, in terms of the information inputting, uh, to ensure that uh, one is as accurate as it can be uh, to avoid, you know, resistant landlord, you know, just challenging um, these types of points at a tribunal. So I suppose a lesson to learn from that would be to make it quite clear in the sort of drafting of these things um, the description of the premises. So here it might be the you know, flats 1 to 13, 51 L court um, square, including roof, buildings, whatever else. It, again, without being too pedantic, uh, I suppose one's got to be as, um, as, 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 as sort of broad in, in, in the definition of these things as one can be, uh, particularly where you know that the landlord will be quite hostile to the um, to, to the claim for right to manage is, is really what I'm getting at. Um, well, it, you know, it was all sort of all well that end well in that particular case, so that, you know, the right to manage company was able to exercise the right, um, albeit, um, you know, the delay in going to tribunal would obviously uh, have a follow-on on the, the acquisition date, because all these matters have to be you know, sort of um, sorted out, and then, um, you know, sort of sorted out, and then, you know, the, the right to manage is then sort of um, acquired later on. I just got a message from somebody, one of the participants, saying they've lost their audio. Um, just sorry to interject there, but I, I thought I'd better make that clear to our technical team that uh, somebody has lost audio. Um, I don't know if it's from them or from us, but it, it will be sorted out um, if it's from our end. Uh, Apologise for that. Hopefully, you have miss too much. Uh, we were just trying to round up this um, upper tribunal decision on, on 51 Earls Court, and I was just saying, you know, if, you, if you've um, rejoined us, hopefully you have, but, um, you know, you've just got to be careful about the drafting of these things. Make sure that, you know, everything is covered, particularly if you know that your landlord is going to be quite hostile to the idea of, of right to manage. So I hope that's clear. Now we move on to the next case, which is this sort of 
I suppose the dogged issue of what is the house, you know, again, Jewel Craft Limited and, uh, and Press, Pressland, um, there's this question of what is the house. And again, I suppose this is an issue that has, you know, sort of, I suppose, contested for a long time where you've got resistant freeholders, you know, your sort of muse house and, you know, so quite expensive houses in central London resisting a leaseholder's right to enfranchise under the 1967 Act. So what would be, what premises would qualify uh, as a house for the purposes of Section 2, Subsection 1? Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, that technical team. Sorry to interject, but you know, I just wanted to say that um, participant has rejoined us, which is a good, good, good to know. Now, what would be a house for the purposes of Section 2.1? As you know, Section 2.1 of the 67 Act gives a leaseholder the right to enfranchise uh, a house for the purposes of um, the Act, and it describes what it, what a house is. And again, I will just briefly mention here that it says that. A house includes any building designed or adapted for living in, and reasonably so called, notwithstanding that the building is not structurally detached, or was or is not solely designed or adapted for living in. So again, you sort of, you, I think you get the feeling of where we're going with this, you know. Reasonable call to house, doesn't matter that it's not um, solely designed or adapted for living in, but as long as it's sort of, and it doesn't really have to be fully structurally detached, but, you know, it's got to have, I suppose, some basic features of what a house is. Now, this went on appeal, this case. What had happened here was you had, just imagine, a ground floor purpose-built shop with residential accommodation on the floor above. And, you know, these buildings constructed in the 20s, they all sort of had a similar uh, appearance. So this ground floor shop could only be accessed by an internal staircase, as it says in the notes. Now, in terms of the first floor, you had your sitting room, two bedrooms, uh, WC. So again, the, the, the reason for this sort of brief outline is to give you a flavour of the building in terms of, you know, with two bedrooms, bathroom and, and, and toilet, um, imagine it is a house because it's got all the features of a house. Now, so if it's remembered that I said there's an internal staircase, that was taken out um, and um, uh, taken out in, in, in the 70s, so that the first floor flat then had an external staircase in the backyard. So you just imagine that you didn't have that sort of internal connection between the two sort of units, you know, the, the, the shop beneath and the flat above with the removal of the staircase, because when the staircase of the internal one was there, you did have that connect between the two units. But with its removal, you almost had, you know, first floor flat became self-contained, and the shop, obviously, uh, with its own um, sort of um, entrance and all that sort of thing. Um, a sublease was granted in, in 1978, and it actually restricted the use of the upper flat to, you know, the, whoever the tenant's employee at the time was. So, again, I suppose it's sort of um, looking at the, 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 the sort of um, the factual matrix to see, well, you know, if, if there's a restriction to have the properties used, um, you know, can we reasonably call this property a house? Went to the county court because clearly the, the leaseholder was seeking enfranchisement. And what the county court said is that, you know, they, they sort of said, this is not a house for the purpose of Section 2.1. And in that judgment, George died, he sort of said, he was looking at the history of the property, the physical appearance. Remember what I said about this sort of um, internal layout that had been changed because of the removal of the staircase. And the use of the premises, you know, you had, I think at this stage, there was a news agent underneath and, and the sort of, um, you know, top floor unit with, with, um, with, with you know, sort of um, uh, residential. But from Judge Dyke's point of view, uh, this wasn't really built as a house because all the properties within the area were in the same sort of fashion, shops beneath and living accommodation above. And living accommodation really for the employee, I think in most circumstances of the, of the shops or whatever uh, the, the, the uh, unit below was used for. So again, because of this, in Judge Dyke's point of view, the removal of the internal staircase was key. That took away from this property the feature of a house for the purposes, certainly of Section 2, Subsection 1. And so it says the two units cannot be said to be a house because they have been physically separated. You have the, you know, the external staircase at the back um, for the upper part of the building. And so by removing this internal staircase, you've taken this property out of the purview of what a house is for the purpose of Section 2, Subsection 1. And so he agreed with the landlord that this 
for the premises were not capable of enfranchisement. And so when it went to the, again, as these matters do, went on appeal, the Court of Appeal took a different view. They sort of said that, you know, again, what was Parliament's intention in terms of, um, you know, sort of enabling uh, these soldiers to enfranchise, you know, and just looking at the physical characteristics of a house is not enough to take it out of Parliament's intention. Again, so you've got to be looking at beyond what is physically possible, you know, other matters to determine whether or not uh, this property is a house. And so here, they sort of, they, they weren't quite sort of satisfied with this sort of physical characteristic. They sort of said, no, we'll look more beyond the physical. We're also going to look at the use to which this property is put. Yes, there is the removal of internal staircase, but that's not enough to take it out of the purview of what is a house. We're going to be looking at this in terms of use, and not just its particular physical characteristics. Um, that's not enough. And so, um, I don't know if you're aware, but there's the case of Tandon, where similar issues where you had shops uh, with, you know, living accommodation before up on top. And um, the Court of Appeal really endorsed that decision to say, look, you're looking more at user rather than physical characteristics. And so, in that sense, this, this building is a house for the purposes of Section 2, Subsection 1. We're not just going to limit, if you like, the interpretation of Section 2, Subsection 1 to um, you know, physically what the property looks like. The fact that you sort of lost that internal connection, remember that internal staircase seemed to be Judge Dyke's uh, reasoning for taking it out of this sort of um, what is a house, if you like, uh, definition. That of itself was not enough. The fact that you didn't have the internal connection, we still consider it as a house because, you know, it, it is a house, reasonably so-called, even though, you know, internally there might be other issues going on. So I suppose this is something that would, uh, that landlords or what leaseholders would welcome, which again extends the sort of uh, definition of what is the house um, in a way, not just the physical characteristics, but the use to which the property is put. Now we're going to be looking at, again, I don't know if, if everyone has noticed that the reference that a Cowell group, you know, a certain Simon Cowell, but anyway, uh, it's not a sort of X factor here, just looking at case law, but I think this is a property that you know, falls within Simon Cowell's sort of uh, property investment group. And again, we're looking at what is the house for the purposes of enfranchisement under the 67 Act. And, you know, again, as with the previous case we saw, um, this is also, you know, central London, very expensive properties, landlords resistant to a claim for enfranchisement because, you know, they obviously want to hold on, I suppose, as best they can to their assets. So essentially what had happened here was that uh, leaseholders sought to enfranchise. If you just imagine this property, just a, a bit of background, I think, which are in the slides. Again, we'll just look at the facts a little bit because they, they obviously turn on the issue. So this house was at the back of number three, Grosvenor Gardens, as it says on the slide. And adjoining this particular house to the north end was one stroke one A Grosvenor Gardens. Now, the house to be enfranchised and one one a Grove Gardens had a party wall division. So there was sort of up until the um uh, the sort of roof of the house, there was this, you know, you can imagine the party wall going up and the party wall, um, in terms of um its existence was referable in both leases of, of one and one a Grove Gardens and the house that was sought to be enfranchised. But one one a Grove Gardens was, you know, quite a number of stories higher than the house. And then you sort of got to a, a higher level where there was an overhang, you know, so sort of, you can imagine, you know, you sort of go up and there's, there's a little bit of, uh, if you like, a, a division in the vertical. And that's exactly what happened here. So a little bit of an overhang, you know, by one width of, of a brick between, you know, the sort of uh, the two premises. And this was the point of contention. Was this overhang, you know, this sort of a slight um, chink, if you like, in the armour, was that enough to take this property out of the uh, purview of what is a house for the purposes of Section 2, Subsection 2? Now, again, the judge at first instance said, well, this is, you know, whatever the deviation is, it's not uh, enough to take it out. I will just read to you, I think it's quite instructive, actually, to sort of um, look at Section 2, Subsection 2. So what Section 2, Subsection 2 says is that Again, remember we're looking at the meaning of house for the purposes. And so references in this part of this act, i.e. section two, subsection two, uh, to a house do not apply to a house which is not 
structurally detached and of which a material part lies above or below a part of the structure not comprising the house. And this is what the landlord's position was. His argument is that, look, this vertical division, there is a, a, a sort of um, overhang, if you like, this sort of one width of a brick, changes things. And so because of this overhang, um, this house is not one that falls within if you like, enfranchisement, uh, the enfranchisement claim under Section 2, Subsection 2, and so I'm going to be resisting the claim. And so the county court said, well, actually, yes, there is a bit of, you know, there's a part of what that divides both properties. As you go vertically up, one width of a brick deviates a little bit, not by much. And so that deviation we would refer to as a de minimis um, deviation. So it's not enough to sort of um, fall within Section 2, Subsection 2, and argue that it's a material part that is lying um, above uh, a structure that's not comprised in the house. Because although, yes, there is a, a bit of a, an overhang, it's not enough to take it out of, um, you know, the sort of uh, the provisions of, of the Act for the purpose of enfranchisement. And so the county court um, agreed with the, the leasehold and said that, they, they, that the property was capable of enfranchisement. And again, you can imagine the landlord wasn't very pleased with this and appealed. And so that the High Court, you know, agreed with the County Court and said, yes, yes, there is a, you know, no doubt about it, there is a sort of uh, overhang. But then what we're looking for, if you're trying to resist a claim on the basis of a material overhang, then you, you've got to be looking at quite a significant deviation from the vertical. So, you know, if you're going upwards and then perhaps uh, an extension has been uh, sort of uh, added onto the property, which then, you know, perhaps a living room or toilet or whatever, which then horizontally is quite significant, you know, so that this property could not be said to be structurally detached, then yes, that would be in Enough to take it out of the purview of Section 2, Subsection 2. But the sort of, I suppose, a dog leg, you can imagine a dog leg, you know, the way that it sort of um, can sort of deviate from, from, I suppose, part of it, um, would not be enough to take this property outside of um, LRA 1967. Again, I think it's significant just to, to, to reiterate this point about if your overhang constituted, a, say, part of a living room or a bedroom or a kitchen or a bathroom, that could take the property out of um, this sort of statutory provision. But again, if we're looking at, you know, a single brick, which is, you know, slightly above the level of the roof, then that type of overhang would be uh, de minimis. And it's not, the, you know, the, again, I suppose one again looks back to, and, and this is what the High Court did in this decision. They sort of went back into, you know, like a parliamentary history. What, what, what was the purpose of the 1967 Act to allow um, people to enfranchise? And so, if we're going to be sort of, you know, being pedantic about, you know, the, the definitions of um, these sorts of things, what is the minimis? If it is the minimis, indeed, then even if you have a slight overhang, that should be enough to take. Uh, the premises out of the purpose, the purview, if you like, of, of LRA 1967, bearing in mind Parliament's intention when they um, drafted this piece of legislation, which is to give leaseholders the right to enfranchise. In any event, I think it's quite important to make a note of this, the landlord interest was protected by Section 2, Subsection 5, if that is applicable. And just to have a quick um, run down of Section 2, Subsection 5, what that is saying is that if the landlord, say for example there's a claim for enfranchisement and the landlord was concerned about, you know, sort of um, the sort of additional premises, you know, this premises which are lying above or below the, the premises sought to be enfranchised, as long as they were not constituting uh, mines or minerals, they've got the right to give the tenant written notice objecting to any further severance. Um, you know, from the, the, the part of their premises. And so if there was a, a sort of uh, sort of dispute about, you know, further severance, then it can be determined by the court. So the landlord, if you like, doesn't always lose out where a leaseholder seeks to enfranchise under the Sixth Seven Act. Uh, these matters can be determined uh, by the court if they're concerned about, you know, sort of chipping away at their property. And so I suppose the, the sort of conclusion of this would be uh, to say that any sort of little chink in the armour will not avoid a claim under Section 2, Subsection 2.
Now, we're going to be looking at um, a collective enfranchisement one here. Um, again, I suppose that the watchword would be landlords, and I think for those who are listening in who are advising landlords, always be careful about what you ask for in your counter notice, particularly if there are these back, back concerns. And ex this is what exactly happened here. You know, the landlord had failed to indicate clearly what they wanted in terms of the lease back, and so they lost out in terms of uh, what they were entitled to. So a bit of a history here, or well, not history, I suppose, factual, factual uh, matrix. Uh, again, just imagine five-floor terrace house, um, flat C was owned by the landlord. She let it on a short-hold tenancy. She sort of lived somewhere else and let it out. But it's fair to say at this stage that uh, she hadn't produced a tenancy agreement. And this is quite important in terms of the extent of what was led to the tenant, because when we come to look at the contents of the lease back, it, it became significant in terms of the extent of what she was entitled to. Uh, because when you're claiming a lease back, you really claim what it is that you already have. So if it's let out to a tenant, landlord doesn't live there, the left out to a tenant, then the, the landlord in terms of the terms of the lease back would be guessing the extent of demise is set out in the tenancy agreement. So again, be quite sort of clear about that if you've got landlords who let out their properties. Now, leaseholders of flat A and B served a claim notice on the landlord, and the landlord didn't, you know, she didn't dispute that, you know, admitted they had a right, but she had the proposals indicated in her counter notice for a lease back of her flat. She also had a desire to convert um, the flat into two units, um, it's a bit sort of uh, significant. So anyway, when she served the counter notice, she wanted the, uh, to include within that counter notice, again, external walls, roof, roof structure, windows, and all sorts of other things. As I said, she did have this intention to redevelop. She also wanted right over the mezzanine area for the storage of bicycles, and also storage of dustbins and, and bicycles in the garden area. So she, she claimed a few things, but the point is she hadn't indicated all these things in her counter notice initially, although she sought to indicate them um, during the, the course of the hearing. So again, you know, she hadn't sort of identified, as I said before, some of the, the, the areas, but uh, sought to do it as part of the hearing. The tenants then, you know, they prepared the lease back. So they sort of prepared the lease back and excluded from it external walls, roof and roof structure and window frames. Now, what was significant is, say, for example, in her tenancy agreement of the tenant, she'd included all these areas as part of what the tenant enjoyed. Then the, um, nominate, nominate, nominate purchaser wouldn't have had a choice because she would be getting back, if you like, by way of lease back, what she'd um, sort of, if you like, given to the tenant by way of the details of the tenancy agreement. And so they couldn't agree on the terms of the lease back, as you can imagine, and apply to the LPT at the time the LPT to resolve the differences. Now, Section 36 and Schedule 9 of the Leasehold Reform, Housing and Urban Development Act 1993 are quite significant here. And Section 36 gives the uh, nominee purchaser the, the um, I feel like the, the, the right to grant a lease back as long as that's in keeping with Schedule 9. And then Schedule 9 sets out um, who is entitled to a lease back and on what terms. And lease back would include, you know, things that are usually enjoyed with and, and, and let with the flat before the date of the service of notice. So what did the LPT have to determine? They were more concerned with the physical extent of premises to be comprised in the lease back. Remember, the landlord wanted all sorts of things. She hadn't quite indicated all those things she wanted when she served her counter notice and sought to do it sort of as part of the hearing. And so um, the LPT was concerned with that. What is the extent of premises that you give in, in, in a lease back? And how should that differ from Part 4, Schedule 9? Because remember, Schedule 9 deals with all the terms of the lease back. Part 4 was quite significant here because it wasn't you know, a, a, a mandatory lease back if it was a social landlord. LDC decided that the premises to be de 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 demised by the lease back were flat in its current state, but it also went on to add rights over common parts in the front garden. It also said that the lease back must accord with part four of the act. 
Uh, again, there was a sort of good member that I sort of mentioned that she had the desire to also redevelop into two units. And so there was a, a, a covenant um, against making alterations without landlord consent, which she, she obviously wasn't happy about. So LVT said, well, you can't sort of, you know, sort of um, depart from those part four provisions. You, your lease back proposals have got to be in keeping with those um, provisions that are set out in part four. Went to the upper tribunal, and upper tribunal said, well, the LVT did err in its approach. They, 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 they've got to look at things slightly differently. You've got to look at what is the entitlement by way of leaseback, what is, what is set out in the counter notice. And so you can't give her more than she's asked for in the counter notice, is what is the essence of what the LBT was, uh, up tribunal was saying. And again, landlord was not entitled to propose departures from part four um, if they hadn't quite specified that in the counter notice. Now, this went to the Court of Appeal, and the question for the Court of Appeal was that, is the landlord entitled in a lease bank to include things that they haven't specified in the counter notice? And also, should the terms of the lease bank depart from Part 4 uh, provisions of the Act when you haven't identified your departure um, in the counter notice? So again, the importance, I think, uh, of emphasizing what needs to go in the counter notice, particularly when a lease bank is proposed. And so, again, Court of Review made it clear it's not for the landlord to spell out in the counter notice departures from Part 4. They've just got to identify what it is they want in terms of the counter notice, the identity of the flat, or any other unit that they claim in the leaseback claim. And so, again, the Court of Appeal made it clear what the leaseback premises should be confined to. So the flat comprising the second and third floor flat, uh, floors, excluding window frames, roof, roof structure, and all those things. Now, I'll just make a point here. If the tenant, because remember that flat was sublet, I told you that before. And um, if the landlord had produced a copy of the tenancy agreement, and the tenancy agreement did include all these things, you know, to say that the tenant, a short short old tenant, was uh, entitled to the window frames and everything else, then no doubt all that would have gone into the counter notice uh, or would have gone into the lease back itself, I beg your pardon. But because the court of appeal didn't have sight of that tenancy agreement, they couldn't quite say that leaseholder was entitled to all these things that she claimed because they were not part of her, um, you know, what she was letting. And remember, with the lease back, you get back what you're actually letting, particularly if the property is sublet. So the landlord's uh, claim failed. So again, I suppose they did give her rights over the mezzanine landing and, and you know, to, to store a dustbin in, in the front garden and all that. But I think just to, again, emphasize the importance of making sure that you do have all, all that you want and at least back in your counter notice. So the appeal did succeed in part. She did get um, the storage areas on the mezzanine landing and, and the bin storage area, but she didn't quite get the roof and, and everything else that she proposed. Uh, the last case we're going to be looking at um, is the lease extension one. And again, it's a sort of the impact of Section 48, subsection 3, when you've got a lease extension claim. So, landlord was ready to complete a lease extension within a month of the terms and price being agreed. Here, the tenant had a delay tactic, so they failed to respond to that request for completion. And rather, what they did was make an application to the county court under Section 48, subsection 3. Again, just a bit of a recap there, but what Section 48, subsection 3 says, which is that it does give a party the right to make an application to the court if at the end of the appropriate period they haven't entered into a new lease. Uh, for the discharge of any obligations that arise out of the service of the notice, being the grant of a new lease, et cetera, et cetera. So the landlord, if like, sorry, the leaseholder made a, an application to the court, although in a way they were guilty of delay. The landlord said, look, it's an abuse of process. I'm, I was ready to complete. The tenant didn't get back to me, and now they want to go to court to get an order. I don't think that um, uh, they should be getting that order. If anything, I think they should be compelled to complete the new list because that's, that's, that, that's what I wanted in the first instance. Tenant said, well, I can, I've got the right to make an application under Section 48, subsection 3, and I'm making it. You know, it doesn't matter what the reasons are, it's a statutory right, and I'm doing it, and that's exactly what they did. And the court said, I think, quite interestingly, that it wasn't an abuse of process. Tenant could make that application under Section 48, subsection 3, in a way relying on their own sort of, I suppose, delay tactic, for want of a better word um, or expression. But then the, the court did sort of, you know, give its own sort of timetable. So again, it says that, um, you know, 
tenants would have to pay interest and landlord's costs if um, a reasonable period for completion had passed, and that period was about two months. So two months after the end of remember the four month period when when they you know they sort of should have completed. A further two months was given as a reasonable time to allow for completion. So I suppose that the lesson to be learned here is that, okay, Section 48.3, again, just some information there which you can read about the terms of that order. But I think what's important, certainly from our point of view, is that the leaseholder could rely on Section 48, subsection 3, as a delay tactic even though they weren't quite ready to complete, although there could be, you know, interest payment implications and perhaps even cost implications if completion isn't sort of effected within the timetable uh, that is set out by the court. So uh, we're going to be taking questions now. I've got my colleague here, Nicholas Kisten, Senior Advisor here at LEASE. Um, whilst we're going through the questions, I'm also going to refer you to the survey, which is going to come up on your screens, and we, I'd be grateful if you can actually um, complete the survey because it, it, you know, it helps us to improve our service and, um, you know, sort of uh, make things more interesting, certainly from a participant's point of view in future. So I'm happy to take questions now. Nicholas Kissin, my colleague, senior advisor here at LEAF, is also happy to take questions and um, Good afternoon, complete please. the survey. Hi, Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, we're waiting for questions, please. This would really help if we get... Oh, here's questions. a question. Oh, maybe anyway. you could answer it, Alero. Uh, but uh, uh, Section 42 notice has been served um, on behalf of my client, and um, the deadline's passed for a counter notice. Um, what can I do now? Because um, the public deadline's passed, and I've had a counter notice. Well, you can apply to uh, the county court for a vesting order, you know, as you know, if the landlord has failed to respond by what the counter notice, then uh, the leaseholder's remedy would be to go to the county court uh, to seek a vesting order, perhaps even cost against the landlord. I suppose one's got to be quite careful, though, when you're seeking a vesting order. It's not just um, landlord hasn't replied. There might be reasons why the landlord hasn't replied, and that if the landlord did show up at county court, they might be able to prove that they hadn't been properly served at the right address. So I think it's important, even if you were going down that route, to ensure that you had sort of done your homework properly in terms of proper service of the notice, ensure that the landlord did get that notice, but whatever the reasons are, they, they didn't respond by counter note, by with a counter notice. So important, I think, to do your background homework, but again, be aware that, yes, there is a right to apply to the county court for a vesting order if the landlord has failed uh, to respond by with a counter notice. I hope that answers your question. Okay, I think you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's right, perfectly okay. answered. I couldn't have done it better myself. <laughs> right, okay, even if you tried. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Right, here's another question that's come up. Uh, you say Wilder and um, London Borough of Hounslow is going on appeal. Uh, whilst we're waiting for the appeal hearing and the, if it does go ahead and the judgment afterwards, mm -hmm. is the decision of the Upper Tribunal Land Chamber good law? And can I safely advise my clients that it is? Um. I think you've got to take a view on that. I mean, the upper tribunal decisions are binding on the lower tribunals and are of equivalent jurisdiction with the high court. Um, but again, I think anyone who's been sort of prudent about these things might want to take, you know, wait for the outcome of that appeal before they decided what the next course of action would be. So it might be worth bearing in mind what, um, you know, sort of uh, the upper tribunal judge said about how you consider um, works that become improvement. And I did sort of, I think I emphasized that during the course of the webinar, that it'll be important to really sort of bear in mind um, the sort of consideration to be given, not just to improvement work, I think to, um, you know, service charge costs generally, because if you can prove that everything and anything has been taken into account, it's more difficult, I think, for a leaseholder to resist um, uh, the claim for service charges, insofar as those charges are reasonably incurred. So it's really that sort of, um, I suppose, Going forward, the, the sort of approach to take with um, 
with um, with uh, costs for improvement. A uh, question here again, just another question on on what the, the previous question uh, asked, which is, do you think Wallen enhances the future test for improvement is a precedent set by the upper tribunal best guidance for clients, given the weight is uh, distant home stand is now difficult to implement. Okay, can I uh, come in yes, that? Yes. Okay, um, I, I, I should add um, that uh, the upper tribunal lands chamber uh, was created in, I think, June 2009. And it's um, under the Tribunal Courts and Enforcement Act 2007, and it's classified as a superior court of record. As such, its decisions do have the force of law, and I think that's what distinguished it from its predecessor, the Lands Tribunal. So its decisions are binding on uh, lower tier tribunals, such as the uh, Lease Hold Evaluation Tribunal and its uh, successor that we now know as uh, the First Tier Tribunal. Uh, Property chamber. Um, so it's the law for the moment until such time, if at all, that the um, Court of Appeal judgment, if it does go ahead, uh, the hearing does go ahead, reverses it. Do I see it as the future test for improvement? It may well be. We'll have to look at the Court of Appeal. Um, I presume it's London Borough of Hounslow, um, or Hounslow Homes, it's been their Elmo uh, that that's launched the appeal. Um, I think it's prudent to say it's guidance because of the Garside case and the test in the Garside case as well, uh, which um, dwelt upon Section 19 reasonableness, and I, I believe Alero touched on it. Did you touch on it? Well, I didn't actually, but I mean, I, I can talk about Garside now, and again, it's yeah. really the sort of, you know, I think when these holders um, are presented with huge bills for service charges, what Garside was saying is that as part of that consideration of whether or not the costs are reasonably incurred, uh, the landlord should also consider whether or not the works can be phased over a period of time. Affordability, but not affordability from the sense of I can't afford to pay it and I don't want to pay it, but rather whether or not it's economically and Feasibly feasible to, if you like, break the works down into stages so that a leaseholder isn't faced with a huge bill. And, and Siobhan McGrath, um, as the upper tribunal judge, did sort of make reference to that in the, uh, in the Waller decision. You know, you've got to bear in mind, you know, what is reasonable has a sort of, you know, some wider impact. It's not just what you think is reasonable, you've also got to be looking at other factors, you know, the sort of um, affordability in the sense of can we break the works down over a period of time so that it's not a sort of leaseholder getting a bill of 60000 or whatever. So I think as Nicholas has said, it is good law. We'll have to wait and see what the Court of Appeal um, decide in it next year when, when the uh, judgment is handed down. Um, I think so far, who knows, might settle, but assuming it doesn't, um, then um, you know, it's the law for the time being, uh, because as I said, it's a superior court of record. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anything more to say about? Uh, well, I think it's just best practice um, suggests that leaseholder views are taken into account anyway. I mean, the choices, the landlords always, but best practice would be to take into account the relevant views of leaseholders, source alternatives. Is, it, is there a better way to do this? Is there a more reasonable way to achieve uh, the objective? And, and, and look to that rather than, you know, wait to be challenged at a tribunal. Okay. Here's one for you. Uh, what happens with cost of a cost challenge under Section 1693 Act? That's lease extension. Isn't yeah. It? Two small flats. Uh, lease one extension agreed and sorted. Lease two agreed straight away on piggyback terms. We even, for one, drafted the lease for two based on lease one supplied office copies, etc. Uh, landlord solicitor wants costs for five hours work and minded to challenge as excessive time in simple case. Um, I think it's always it's always a contentious issue, isn't it, cost? Because I suppose, you know, if you look at Section 6, it does sort of give the impression that it's what the landlord would have paid if had they been paying for it themselves. It's not a sort of blank check, you know, I fancy a bit of extra cash, somebody else is paying for it, and I will charge whatever. It's really that sort of, there's got to be the evidence that the costs are reasonably incurred. Now, if you're saying five hours worth of work is excessive from the landlord solicitor's point of view, 
then it's got to be, I think, looking at the schedule of costs. And if you look at tribunal decisions, I think Drax and Lawn Court is quite an instructive one, which although it had to do with collective infantrismen, still the same issue about costs and how the tribunal considered these costs. You know, in Drax, there was an excessive, it's like, interaction between the um, landlord and their solicitor. And some of the work could have been done by somebody more junior. So the, the tribunal were quite critical of the excessive um, costs that were spent on the transaction. Although they did allow for some of the costs, they did sort of cut back a few. So I think if you get a, a breakdown um, which sort of indicates that, you know, a lot of the work that was done was fairly repetitive, could have been done by somebody more junior, um, again, excessive time wasted on dealing with what was a straightforward matter, then, you know, you're more likely to succeed in terms of, of the cost breakdown, uh, perhaps uh, the reasonableness challenge. Another thing to note, and I think sometimes, uh, particularly if you're acting for the leaseholder, excuse me, leaseholders do get it uh, sort of slightly wrong, where they think, well, you know, my solicitor charged me £500 and the landlord solicitor is charging, uh, you know, £800 or £900 or whatever. You know, there's got to be, the tribunals are always keen to emphasize the sort of uh, comparative nature of these things. So you've got to be looking at like-for-like -like quotes. You know, if the leaseholder's got it lucky or their solicitor's not, you know, uh, on the on, on the sort of you know somewhere in central London, then that's not to say that the landlord who's got central London solicitors must for somebody on the high street because the leaseholder has somebody on the high street. So it's really the sort of like-for-like -like comparisons in terms of the uh, type of firms that we're looking at, the um, costing itself, you know, who's done the work, should someone more junior have done it uh, in, in, instead of the senior partner or, or whatever. But look at Drax and Lawn Court. It's a useful one in terms of cost uh, and how tribunals approach um, the, the whole issue of cost. Nicholas, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, yes. Yeah. There have been a huge number of cases on 938 costs that have gone to the uh, Upper Tribunal uh, Lands Chamber or its predecessor, the Lands Tribunal. However, I believe after you prepared your slides, I seem to recall uh, reading um, on the Lands Tribunal website, um, there's recently been a case, and I think it's called Sidewalk and Twin, um, about costs. Right. Um, and. Um, uh, maybe we can cover in a future uh, case law update, but it was about whether you can recover. Do you want to give the reference for that? So um, well, I can, well, I think we can give it offline maybe right, if anybody okay. wants to get in touch with us. It was mm -hmm. recently posted, I, I had a look at it briefly on the Upper Tribunal Land Chamber website, but it was to my recollection about whether an in-house solicitor who's uh, involved with responding to several lease extension claims, whether their costs could be recoverable, as if they were private solicitor, you know, whether there'd be an equivalent hourly rate for private practice. Um, if you want to get a touch with either uh, Alera or myself offline, we can provide the reference number. Uh, here is a, another question about costs. Um, ah, can I just read it? All right, it says, managing agents' fees, um, can they be recovered uh, in a collective enfranchisement case under Section 33? Do you want me to answer that one? Yes, please. Okay. Ball's been thrown at me and I've caught it. Well, it, it, it happens there was a case last year, and I'm trying to call it was I think it was called Lazy and Mansions, L E Y S I A N, which is a block of flats, I think it's a mansion block above shops in City Road near one of our old offices. And that said that in certain circumstances it, it was that they were uh, professional fees potentially recoverable under Section 33 uh, because managing agents were engaged to, to, my, to my recollection about advising on parking spaces and you know, that they had some relevance uh, to the um, collective enfranchisement claim. Uh, I think it was called Columbia House. Uh, the, it was Upper Tribunal Lands Chamber. Do you remember it? Yeah, Columbia yeah. House. So um, there's your answer. Uh, I mean, I suppose just to add on to what Nicholas has said, in that Columbia House case, I mean, the managing agents had done a lot of work in terms of providing service charge accounts, statements, all sorts of information that the lease or the work the nominee purchaser would find quite helpful in terms of future management of the building. And so, in those circumstances, the upper tribunal said yes the costs were recoverable under Section 33. And I suppose it's, I, don't, I don't think that case sort of sets out the uh, sets out a precedent, you know, managing agents all of a sudden all the fees are recoverable. No, I think it's got to be defined what it is the managing agents have done as part of that collective enfranchisement claim. 
which then necessitates the sort of a cost recovery. So I think again, we, we've got to make that clear. It's not that they, you know, just get their costs. They only get their costs because they they can demonstrate that they have, if you like, incurred it by by assisting in that uh, collective enfranchisement claim. So I hope that sort of has answered that question. Okay. Um, Keep the questions coming in because I think that they're helpful for all of us, you know, Nicholas and I, and, and obviously other people who were listening in as well. So we do find them useful. And please don't forget to complete the um, the uh, survey. Uh, that really helps us to improve our services, also. Okay. Okay. Um, right. What's this question? Um, have there been any cases recently on uh, invalidity of Section 13 notices or uh, striking them down, I presume, is, is what the question is asking? Do you think of any? I can't, in actually, year? in the past year. No, no. Can you? Section 13? Um, there was one, I believe it was last year, or maybe right. it was a year and a half ago. Do you remember Nat and Osmond? Do you remember that one, Upper Tribe in Orlando's Chamber, I believe? And that's where there was some argument about whether something was a qualifying tenancy. I think it was the uh, freeholders' daughters' flat, uh, and, and they, but they said it was, and it was left out, and uh, because it was essential that the naming of that qualifying tenancy should should have been on the um, Section 13 notice, that it was a uh, uh, that they said the notice was completely invalid. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and the reason why is they, they said that they were moving away from the previous test of invalidity because they there was a distinction in mandatory and directory. Mm -hmm. so if something was a mandatory requirement, it made it invalid. If it was a directory requirement, it didn't make it invalid. Exactly. And they moved away from that uh, in this particular case and said, does it go to the actual purpose of the statute, the legislation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they said that giving details of the qualifying tenancies so that one could work out eligibility mm -hmm. of the building, etc., was an essential requirement that went to the uh, purpose of the legislation and of Section 13, and mm -hmm. therefore, for that reason, it, it was rendered invalid. I think, it's, I mean, it, it is practical what you've explained about that case, but Nicholas, what's, um, what's I suppose, good for the nominee purchaser is that it doesn't delay, you know, it's not, a, it's not the equivalent of a notice being deemed withdrawn or expressed withdrawn or those circumstances that enable the nominee purchaser to wait another 12 months. So even if the notice is invalid, they can always sort of serve another one uh, and get on with it because if it's invalid, then, you know, didn't it really exist to begin with? Although, having said all that, there will be cost like Ability, which is to say that you know, as people in private practice, you've got to be extremely careful with these things. Particularly, I, I think I, I talk a lot about right to manage notices in terms of um, drafting them, because if you've got a resistant landlord, and there are quite a number of resistant landlords out there, they will challenge and challenge for anything and everything. Um, so it's always important, I think, when when one's looking at these notices, to make sure that they are as foolproof as they can be. I mean, again, with, with the right to manage, you don't have the same sort of, you know, there isn't the sort of, you got it wrong, you can't do it again. Of course you can, but it's the, it's the delay that can be necessitated when you have to, you know, serve another notice or the landlord challenges is unsuccessful, but then that's delaying the acquisition date by, you know, until all the rights of appeal, et cetera, have been exhausted. So it, oh, I think the prudent thing to do would be particularly for those in practice who are aware of the identity of, of landlords who are, you know, keen to challenge any and everything to make sure that they are sort of um, crossing the T's and dotting the I's as best they can. Uh, so that, you know, with the best will in the world, it may be difficult even for a landlord to challenge. Uh, whether or not the, the claim notices uh, and, and uh, whatever else they have been validly uh, served. Okay, here's another question. Um, apart from Walla and London Borough of Hounslow, are there any other cases um, being appealed at the moment uh, relevant to residential leasehold property of which we should be aware? Do you think of any? Nicholas, I'm sure you can think of some if they um, <laughs> well, one one crosses my mind. Well, there's a few. Yes, yeah. I think two or three. There's um, I think it, it, the Walden a Cordway in Cateb, um, and that is about um, I think that's going to call the pill in October. Anybody involved knows about it? Maybe they could chip in. Cordway in Cateb 
is uh, a lease extension. The intermediate landlord served a notice of separate representation. And then my, my recollection is that the freeholder did a deal on the price. The superior land and the competent landlord did a deal on the price without reference. And, and was that possible? And there's an appeal, uh, my recollection is there's an appeal going to the Court of Appeal, and, it, and it's about October time that the hearing is expected to take place. There's also, is it Edwards against Kurosami? Yeah. I think it's next May, this coming May, it is next month. Supreme Court, uh, it's an assured tenancy uh, let by a leaseholder. And the issue was whether the leaseholder is responsible for uh, a path, a stone that got loose on a path, uh, and a tenant tripped. And they said under Section 11, Capital A of Act 1988, that they were responsible for that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tenancy, Ron, but it's also got leaseholder implications. Mm -hmm. um, that's another one. That's going to the Supreme Court. Any more? Um, there are a couple of cases which I think have been heard and we're waiting for decision. There's one, I think it's Elm Park Gardens or something like that in sort of the SW3 Chelsea-ish area on hedonic regression. And those who uh, like to keep up with valuation <laughs> issues, hedonic regression, a method of uh, you alternative to, method you to... that, Nicholas? What is no, it? thanks. <laughs> hedonic regression is, a, is an alternative method to traditional one of graphs for establishing relativity. Um, there was a case where they tried to advance the leaseholders try to advance hedonic regression, which is looking at transactions pre the 93 Act to show what prices are in the no Act world pre the 1993 leasehold reform housing and development act. And there was a, a an analysis that, and it was a case um, in in the um, uh, upper tribunal land. I think it was upper tribunal land chamber and. Um, it didn't succeed. I can't remember the name offhand, but it was um, oh Philomora Costas, Cost Costas, um, and but they said there was to be more. You know, it, it fell off because they couldn't link the hedonic regression methodology to valuation principles. So there was in one case since at I think the Thirty Toronto Property Chamber, Melbury Road on houses, and there's this one. I think it's maybe couple or maybe three cases consolidated that was heard at the Upper Tribunal Lands Chamber, I think, in January or February, and we're waiting for the decision. And um, I believe there was a case, I don't know if it went ahead last month, at the Upper Tribunal Lands Chamber uh, on costs, about three cases consolidated on the War 13, The because um, it's a costs, so no cost jurisdiction mm. at the first tier tribunal uh, property chamber, save in certain circumstances, uh, laid down by Rule 13. Somebody's behaved frivolously, vexatiously, etc. No realistic prospects of success. And this was going to be regarded as a case, about three cases consolidated, where they'd be giving guidance on Rule 13. And I'm saying it was listed for uh, three for the, for the last month, March. Um, I don't know if the hearing went ahead. I have no reason to believe otherwise. And if it did, in which case we're waiting for the decision. And it might form the um, the basis of, uh, I suppose, a future case or what update. I mean, speaking about cost, Nicholas, it is you know it's quite a sort of contentious one. You know, is that if you've got a small amount and and um, you know the costs are racking up because I mean, when I say small amount, it's like the the Kane and London bar of uh, the, the sort of um, case that we looked at earlier on. You know, Mr. Kane. Uh, oh, that one about the payments. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. You know, the amounts in issue were not a lot when you looked at the um, the sort of gist of it. You know, he was challenging, you know, £200 and, and £300. And, you know, he had instructed counsel, which would cost him a little bit of money. So, um, but I suppose, you know, the tribunal is not there to put people off because of costs. So the, the sort of, um, Nicholas, the cases that you mentioned, I mean, I mean I'm really looking forward to, to sort of reading about them just to get an idea about, you know, what are the guidelines when, when parties are, um, you know, sort of challenging or demanding costs uh, post-tribunal uh, hearings because, you know, the whole purpose of tribunal is really not to put people off of being litigious, but again, you don't want to encourage, I suppose, uh, you know, uh, sort of serial litigants who are just going to, for the heck of it, um, take a matter to a tribunal. 
So that would be uh, quite useful. I would say, um, you know, sort of uh, look on our website for, for any sort of um, highlights. Uh, Nicholas usually presents highlights on on, um, on this type of uh, issues when they do come up. Okay. Right. Um, uh, before we go, I just want to mention that I shall be uh, doing a webinar uh, next month, 17th of May, on Shared Ownership 2016. I'll be doing it with my uh, colleague, Richard Hand. Important subject, uh, Shared Ownership. A lot of interest in it, particularly in, in the London area, but also I think around the country now. Um, and the various topics include how is it different from other forms of property tenure, different types of shared ownership lease. Believe it or not, there are quite a number of different uh, you know, range of shared ownership types leases. Staircasing, what does it involve? And also, um, you know, whether it's prudent to go ahead. How far can the lease be varied? Yep. Rent and rent review? Yep and the implications of Richardson against Midland Heart Limited. I think mean, that's the only case really of mm -hmm. great significance to my knowledge on um, shared ownership, but just mark it out as unusual um, and a different form of tenure. So that shared ownership, whether you're a conveyancer, whether you're a property litigator, whether you're managing property, and particularly if you're in a housing association, um, then I strongly recommend you to tune in to the webinar on shared ownership that is taking place starting at one o'clock on the 17th of May, 2016. Right, well, I think that brings us to an end now. What I'd like to uh, say is thank you very much for listening and for listening to Alero uh, do her um, webinar and um, for welcoming me to take questions at the end. Thank you, Nicholas, because that, that, that sort of was very helpful, and I'm sure um, you know the participants enjoyed um, learning from you. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening to the webinar today. I hope you've, uh, you've learned a lot about uh, the issues that we've discussed today. I've enjoyed presenting this, and I look forward to, um, to sort of presenting you know, another interesting webinar for your uh, benefit after Nicholas's on the 17th of May. Thank you, and goodbye. Cheers.